Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. On March 20th, 1993, two bombs went off in a shopping center in Warrington, England. The Provisional Irish Republican Army would eventually claim responsibility, but representatives for the IRA maintained that sufficient warning had been given to allow for an evacuation, with precise instructions for where the bombs were going to go off, and that they only intended to damage property, not people. However, the authorities insisted that the warnings they had received were too vague to identify a specific target, and ultimately, no evacuation took place. Fifty-four people were injured, and the attack claimed the lives of two children, 12-year-old Tim Perry and 3-year-old Jonathan Ball. It was a particularly heartbreaking moment during the Troubles, a decades-long violent conflict over the sovereignty of Northern Ireland. Not far from the site in Warrington, though, a young rock band called the Cranberries sat in their tour bus. The experience of being so close to such a profound tragedy deeply affected the band's lead singer, Dolores O'Riordan, herself an Irish national. She decided to channel the rage and pain she was feeling in that moment into her art, and the resulting song, Zombie, lives on as a haunting reminder of the human costs of these sorts of conflicts. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. But I think most listeners would agree that it really starts a couple bars later when they do this. And the first thing we have to talk about is tone. In most Cranberry songs, the guitars sound something like this. But while the band was working on Zombie, O'Riordan kept asking for more and more distortion. The end result is something that sounds less like the Cranberries and more like Alice in Chains. And that's the point. Distortion in guitar-based music often conveys a sense of anger, and Zombie is the heaviest and angriest song the Cranberries ever made. But it's not the sort of explosive, immediate anger that comes from a single event. The thick distortion, coupled with the consistent, pounding eighth note chords at a relatively slow, ballad-like tempo, conveys a seething rage born of decades of pain and grief. It's an anger that can't see the finish line, that knows tomorrow's gonna be just as bad as today, but it's an anger that's willing to fight to make sure that someday it won't be. And we can see that pretty clearly in the dynamic structure of the song. I skipped over the first part of the intro, but I probably shouldn't have, because it's actually pretty important that they don't start with distortion. You see, while distortion can convey anger, it can also convey a sense of confusion and chaos. Starting off with a clean, echoey guitar tone creates a slightly uneasy but ultimately tranquil soundscape that's suddenly violently interrupted by an explosion of harsh, distorted noise. It's a powerful musical metaphor for the source of attacks O'Riordan was responding to. But the most important choice they make is to not stay at that level. The song oscillates between big distorted choruses and much quieter verses where the guitars drop into the background, handing the reins off to Mike Hogan's ominous bass. This cycle of nervous peace and sudden eruptions speaks to the experience of living through a time like the Troubles, where violence could break out anywhere, at any moment. And that same sense of confusion can also be found in the harmony. In principle, Zombie uses a pretty mundane chord loop. That's what they're playing for most of the song. Not all of it, we'll get there, but most of it. Theorists call this the minor axis progression, and I have a whole video about it if you're interested, but the point is you've probably already heard this in dozens, if not hundreds of other songs. Sort of. As is often the case with rock harmony, a simple chord chart doesn't tell the full story. Like, let's look at the clean intro. While the basic structure of the loop is there, it sounds to Myers like O'Riordan is leaving the top two strings of the guitar open and just letting them ring over every chord. Those strings play E and B, and as we move through the loop, those notes develop increasingly complex relationships with the underlying harmony. Like, we start with E minor. E is the root of that chord, and B is the fifth, so they both blend in perfectly. Next, though, we move to C major. Here, E becomes the third, which is the most colorful chord tone, the one that makes it sound major. 
But the real star is B, which is the seventh. This is a sharp, jagged sound, giving the serene major chord a slightly bitter edge. After that comes G major, and now B becomes the third, but E is no longer a chord tone at all. Now it's the sixth. Honestly, it's debatable whether the major sixth actually sounds more complex than the major seventh, but I still find this chord more striking than the last one, simply because the E is on top. When listening to chord voicings, we tend to latch onto the highest and lowest notes most easily, so well, theoretically, this chord may be more consonant than the last one, the disruptive tone is also more prominent. And finally, she goes to D major, and all hell breaks loose. Neither B nor E is a chord tone here. They're the 6th and ninth, respectively. This gives the chord a rich, but pretty ambiguous sound, which she amplifies by voicing it with an F sharp as the lowest note, so it's not entirely clear that this is really even a D chord at all. Taken as a whole, this gives us a chord progression that seems to fall apart as it goes, with less and less structural coherence the deeper we get, until we wind up with a pile of notes so jumbled that putting any particular chord symbol on it almost feels like cheating. And while they don't keep up these specific voicings in every section, they do keep the basic idea of destabilizing the later chords. This is most obvious in the bass part, where Mike Hogan does that F sharp under the D chord throughout the song. It's a subtle disillusion that reflects a world that refuses to make sense. After the initial burst of distortion, things settle back down again, and right before the verse, O'Riordan plays this devastatingly simple riff. I'll keep the last note a mystery for now. Anyway, what makes it so powerful? Well, let's start with the rhythm. The underlying meter is clearly 4-4, but these little fragments of melody are each three eighth notes long. That doesn't fit, so the notes seem to fall in disarray against the pulse. And this is emphasized by leaving an eighth note rest at the end of each one so they can't flow into each other. Each fragment is its own thing. Each one is positioned differently relative to the underlying beat, and that carries over across bars, so the downbeat of the second bar is missing. There's still a pattern here, but it's awkwardly imposed on the structure beneath it. But the real secret is the notes. Possibly the most fundamental tool in a songwriter's toolbox of metaphors is melodic direction. Which way are the notes going? Rising melodies, especially ones that go up by step, tend to convey a sense of brightness and hope, while falling melodies tell stories of disappointment and failure. In the first bar, All we get is a single step up, but each time it starts a little bit lower. We have these little moments of hope that are slowly sinking into despair. The second bar starts similarly, then it turns around, skipping over the root and settling on D, the flat 7 of the key. And that brings us to our mystery note. These Ds are on beats 3 and 4, so what note does she play on the downbeat? Well, if you guess that she steps up to E, resolving the line to the root of the key, then congratulations, you've successfully used your pattern recognition skills, along with your understanding of tonality and musical motifs, to identify the note this riff is very clearly telling you it's going to end on. It's not subtle. There's a big flashing neon sign that says we're about to hear an E. And in most songs, that's exactly what would happen. But in Zombie, she instead plays this... And that's devastating. We have this fading hope, this constant effort to rise up in a world that keeps pulling her down, and in her final moments, she slows down, musters her strength for one last push upwards, and... falls. <sighs> Damn. As we move into the verse, the first thing I want to talk about is Fergal Lawler's drums. It's a pretty standard rock beat with one significant difference. He's replaced the backbeat snare with a tom. This does a couple things. First, it mellows out the verses. The snare drum has a sharp piercing sound, whereas the tom is a much warmer tone. He does play the snare in the choruses, so this feels like a de-escalation, reducing the intensity of the music. But in this specific song, the sound of a tom also kind of reminds me of a baran, a kind of hand drum that's common in a lot of Celtic folk music. Now, to be clear, it's not a perfect comparison. The rhythm 
rhythm is just a simple backbeat, not the sort of rolling reel patterns you might expect to hear from a baron player, and a tom drum doesn't have nearly the level of tone control that a baron does either. But as someone who listens to a lot of Celtic folk rock, it's still a very familiar sound to me, and the clever use of these deep, resonant toms feels like a subtle nod to the song's deeply Irish roots. But the biggest thing here is, of course, the vocals. Head hangs slowly, child will slowly take First, let's talk melody. This is doing a similar thing to that guitar line, taking a simple motif and sliding it down. Here, the motif is another walk down the scale, so we've got a descending line of descending lines, but honestly, it feels a lot more hopeful to me than the riff did. If I had to guess, I'd say that's down to the lack of rest between the phrases. In the riff, there's a pause after each fragment, drawing your attention to the way the starting notes keep getting lower, but here they flow into each other, so each one begins by jumping up. As she gets to the bottom, she sings this, where she hits a G, then the notes above and below it. Remember that shape? It'll come up again later. But the main thing I want to emphasize here is her phrasing, and to understand that, we're gonna have to talk about poetic meter. In traditional English language poetry, a poem gets its structure from the distribution of accented syllables. Like, you may have heard that Shakespeare often wrote an iambic pentameter, which just means that each line in his poems consists of five iams. An iamb is a pair of syllables where the accent is on the second one, like mistake or alone. Iambic pentameter, then, means ten syllables with an accent on every second one, like shall I compare to a summer's day. The verse in Zombie, on the other hand, is basically using trochaic septameter, or lines consisting of seven trochies. A troche is like the opposite of an iamb. It's two syllables with an accent on the first one, like taken, silence, or zombie. String a bunch of those together, and you get a line like, when the violence causes silence, we must be mistaken. Even just spoken like that, the poetic meter gives it a clear, rhythmic, almost lyrical structure. But this isn't a poem, it's a song, which means we also have to consider the interactions with musical meter. Take the first line. Head hangs slowly, child slowly take the trochees are emphasized melodically, with the strong syllables mostly coinciding with those upward leaps. After this little grace note on beat 2, she starts hitting every offbeat eighth, spacing the syllables evenly throughout the bar and avoiding all the beats until the very end. But let's look at the end. Here she finally drops the syncopation and sings the final note on the downbeat, but remember, She's singing trochees. That means the last syllable, the only one in the entire phrase that's accented rhythmically, is not accented poetically. When you hear the word taken, the stress is clearly on the first syllable, not the second one. This effectively buries the last note, so while it's in a strong metric position, it doesn't feel like it belongs there. It's a resolution of sorts, but not a comfortable one, a fact that's emphasized by her hanging on a relatively unstable F-sharp. Next, we move into the pre-chorus. It's not me, it's not my family. Here, we've got a new kind of poetic structure. Instead of trochees, she's singing amphimacers. Poetry words are weird. Anyway, an amphimacer is a three-syllable pattern with accents on the first and third syllables, like it's not me or in your head. This allows her to break the lines up into more discrete fragments with a faster rhythm to build excitement and tension at the same time. She positions these three-note phrases in the cracks between beats one and three, so while before she was avoiding all the beats, here she's just avoiding the strongest ones. She does still keep the emphasis on the offbeats, though, using that amphimacer structure to position the weakest syllables on beats two and four. And just like in the verses, she ends each phrase on the downbeat, adding an extra syllable to the end of the final line, but once again, that syllable is weak. They Are Fighting is right back to our trochee pattern, and the note on the downbeat feels linguistically out of place. It sounds like this... They are fighting! And hey, it's that same G A F sharp figure that ended the verse phrase. What a weird coincidence. That probably won't come up again. And then, of course, there's the chorus, where all of this really comes together. So, okay, a couple things going on here. First, melodically, we've got F-sharp and then the notes above and below it. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's the same motif that's ended all our phrases so far, but shifted down a step. 
And that's a huge deal. In the original motif, we start on G, a relatively stable chord tone in the key, then hit A and F sharp, which are both tensions. We're moving from resolution to dissonance. But here we start on F sharp, an unstable note, then move up to G, a chord tone, before ultimately falling to E, the root. By moving all the notes down a step, we've gone from a cliffhanger to a solid landing. The second line elaborates on that singing basically the same thing but with some added A's for decoration, and then we get this. Where the motif continues down, this time starting on E. This feels like a kind of middle ground for the dissonance. The line ends on D, the minor seventh, which is neither as stable as the root, nor as unstable as the second. It doesn't feel resolved, but it also doesn't really feel like it needs to. But I know what you're all thinking. Hey 12 tone, what about the poetic meter? Great question, glad you asked. Let's go back to the first line. Like I mentioned earlier, In Your Head is an amphimacer with accents on the first and third syllables. Nothing's changed. Well, except for everything. You see, when she moves into the chorus, she delays the line slightly, starting it on beat 4, which means that it now ends on beat 1. And that's what we've been building towards this whole time. Up to now, whenever she sang on the downbeat, or really any beat at all, it's always been a weak syllable, contradicting the implied rhythmic strength. But here, finally, the two are aligned. Poetic meter and musical meter agree that right now, in this moment, you need to feel how powerful this note is. And by keeping that from you for so long, she makes it so that when it finally arrives, it feels like a revelation. The sky opens up as she hits this chorus, not just because the guitars turn on the distortion, but because the lyrics finally make sense. It's just such good vocal writing. And, of course, we also have to talk about vocal tone. We already discussed the emotional impact of guitar distortion, but that's a setting you can change by just turning a knob. Vocal distortion, on the other hand, requires you to physically change the shape of your throat, making it much more viscerally impactful. There's lots of different kinds of vocal distortion, but when O'Riordan sings, That sort of uncontrolled guttural rasp gives it a desperate edge that builds as she repeats the same word over and over. The other thing I want to highlight in the chorus is Mike Hogan's bass. In the verses, he was mostly hammering out roots, with a little extra flourish in the last bar of each phrase to set up the start of the loop, And here it's largely the same, but with a similar flourish at the end of every bar. It's a little more subtle, both because it's buried under the distorted guitars and because he only plays the extra note once, but on beat four of each of the first three bars, he sets up the next chord by playing its fifth, so he prepares C major with a G, G major with a D, and D major with an A, before playing that same half-step flourish to walk back down to E minor. This gives the section a bit more momentum, and it helps set us up for the next big change. That happens after the second chorus, where the guitar drops out and we find ourselves in the bass breakdown. Here, Hogan plays this, which is an even more elaborate version of that pattern, starting on E, jumping up to C, then doing a big walk back down. Remember how I said earlier that they only played the chord loop for most of the song? This is where it breaks. There's no explicit harmony here, but it seems pretty clear that if there was, it'd just be alternating between E minor and C major, the first two chords of the loop. Combine that with a sudden drop in intensity and the fact that everything Hogan plays here can be drawn from the C major pentatonic scale, and this section really doesn't seem to be moving. It's not relaxed, but it's waiting, like a spring coiled up under tension. So what's he waiting for? O'Riordan answers that by returning with a new guitar lick. But is it actually new? Well, okay, so yes, it is, but not as new as you might think. Remember that motif from the vocal melody where she hits G, then the notes above and below it? Remember how it defined pretty much every important melodic moment in the entire song? Yeah, this is that again. Except... Not exactly. Do you remember that devastating walkdown O'Riordan played at the start of the verse, the one where she took an upward step and slid it down the scale? 
this is that too. It's both, but it's also kind of neither, and to understand just how important that is, we're gonna have to look at how she changed each line to fit into the other. Let's start with the trill. There's three main changes here. First, she moved it up to start on the next chord tone, B. We already saw her changing the starting note in the chorus, but those all went down, so lifting it higher is still a new and exciting thing. Second, she resolves it at the end. Instead of hanging on the dissonant A, she slides back up to B, releasing the tension by returning to a stable point. And third, she changes the meter. Up to now, she mostly sang the lowest note on the downbeat, emphasizing the lack of resolution, but here, she puts the Bs on beats 1 and 3, the two strongest metric positions, with the trill happening on the offbeats in between. With all these changes, it feels like we're seeing the trill in its complete final form, the way it was always supposed to sound, with a clear, unambiguous resolution that she just wouldn't let us hear until now. From the perspective of the walkdown, though, the change is a lot simpler. She just stops playing after the second fragment. This leaves us back on B, so instead of falling down an octave, we stay right where we started. Everything else, including the rhythm and the register, remains exactly the same, but by ending the line before things go downhill, it becomes hopeful again. One could easily read this lick as a sort of plea for unity and peace, taking all the different kinds of tension from earlier and combining them together to create something beautiful and whole. From there, the rest of the band comes back and O'Riordan takes a solo based on this same idea... Except now she's playing two notes at a time, adding in a second line a perfect fourth below the main one. If we're reading this motif as a plea for peace, then as it progresses that plea seems to grow increasingly desperate, working its way into every element of the solo as the band beneath her grows in intensity, culminating in Lawler pounding the drums with snares on all four beats as she loops the phrase over and over. <laughs> At the end of the solo, she and guitarist Noel Hogan drop out, leaving us in another bass breakdown, then we get some building guitar feedback before the song suddenly unceremoniously ends with one last hit. And that's pretty much it. Even without knowing the history, Zombie is a pretty intense song, but once you understand where they're coming from, it becomes an undeniably powerful piece of protest music. It puts a voice to the grief and rage that ravage communities where violence has become a part of everyday life, and it reminds us to honor the dead by doing everything we can to avoid creating more of them. Thankfully, the troubles officially ended in 1998, a couple years after Zombie's release with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. But while the violence is largely over, over, these sorts of scars can take a long time to heal, and until they do, works of art like Zombie will be there to remind us of everything, and everyone, that was lost along the way. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Wilamowski, Grant Aldonis, and Damian Fuller Sutherland. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, Keep on rockin'.